Welcome to the Droma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association or JOMA podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And tonight I'm really, really honored and really, really excited to be interviewing Dr. Cindy Hovington. Before I start, um, I will say, please reach out to me if there is a topic or a speaker um, you want to hear or you yourself want to be interviewed. Um, reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma.org. And now to Dr. Cindy Hovington, who I found myself and hunted down, <laughs> tracked her down and waited patiently. Dr. Hovington has a Bachelor of Science degree in clinical exercise physiology and a master's in rehabilitation science from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She completed a postdoctoral fellow at McGill in education, and she received her PhD in neuroscience also from McGill University. Dr. Hovington is the recipient of six awards and is the author of eight journal articles. She says, after becoming a mom for the first time in 2015, she learned that there were very few evidence-based resources available to support parents. And she left academia to stay home with her three children and decided that she needed to create a reliable and science-backed resource that all parents can access. This is how Curious Neuron was born and has grown into a community of over 100,000 international parents. She is found on Instagram at the Curious underscore Neuron. By making science accessible to parents, we make informed decisions about our children and develop tools and skills that help us and help our children thrive, she says. Dr. Hovington has published her work in psychological and educational journals, including neurorehabilitation and neuro repair, BMC psychiatry, schizophrenia, and science and children. She is a parenting contributor for CJAD 800 and has appeared on the Global News Montreal. She's given webinars for Learn Quebec, the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapists, the Society for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy 2021 Conference and more. Curious Neuron and Dr. Hovington's work has been highlighted in Canadian, US, and UK magazines. She has worked with companies including Pampers, Pock Pock, Great Lobe, edX, Education, Datitude, Grin Natural, Groups, Peanut, and more. And most recently, she is the new founder of Wondergrade, W-O-N-D-E-R-G-R-A-D-E, an app that helps parents and their children develop emotional regulation. Welcome, Dr. Hovington. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so, so excited. I've been looking forward to this for such a long time. And as I told you, I've been binging on your podcast. It's amazing. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I love the podcast. I, as you know, like just being able to speak to an audience and, and share this information with them is so fun. It really, really is. So I want to talk just to start, I want to talk about parenting styles because I've heard in your podcast new terms that I have never heard before mm. about gentle parenting, conscious parenting. Before those, I want to start with the ones I know, <laughs> which are the authoritative, <laughs> authoritarian, and permissive. Yes. <laughs> I know, please. <laughs> yes, definitely. The reason why I like to talk about those terms that are from science is because we often do hear about the gentle parenting, the conscious parenting. And, and I think it sometimes there's, I think there's a misconception around them that it means to just be best friends with your child. And maybe we're trying to undo what our generation perhaps went through, which is your parent is not your friend. (laughs) That's what I was, that's how I was raised personally. Um, And, you know, it was a lot of rules and limits and boundaries and the kind of connection and the sensitivity, like the sensitivity part of it wasn't really there and it wasn't their fault. It's just that they were raised by that their gener- the other generation, my grandparents, were that way as well. Um, so if you look at the research, they say that it's really important to balance both the boundaries and limits with the sensitivity and connection. And that's authoritarian, um, authoritative parenting. It, there's a lot of words, <laughs> they're really big words but sometimes. But it's kind of authoritarian and authoritative. I always get confused. Yeah. So I always, I like the, the authoritarian is like that, that parent that says, you do what I say, I'm the parent. And there's really no uh, room for that 
relationship or connection with the, the child. Although, you know, everything is or nothing is ever to an extreme. So you can have parents that are very authoritarian and like there are rules and I'm not your friend, but they can have a connection. So there's always the exceptions. But in general, when you look at the research, it's recommended that you move away from the authoritarian parenting, which is what many of us were raised in, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, versus now what we understand is that connection part and that sensitivity part is really important for children and for their development. So that's the authoritative parenting where you're balancing both. And then on the other end, you can have a parent who says, well, I'm all about the connection and sensitivity and there's there are no rules within my home. That's more of the... Um, I want to say it's not neglectful, permissive. it's permissive. Thank you. That's being permissive, right? A child actually needs boundaries and limits. And a child who has who was raised in an environment where there aren't any boundaries and limits will actually struggle later on because they will be very uncomfortable. They won't have built that resilience around rules. So when they're told not to do something, it could lead to a lot more of the emotional part and the, the sort of mental health aspect of, you know, being okay with certain aspects of, of uh, adulthood and being told no and in relationships and so on, and it's not comfortable. So the rules and the limits are really important. Uh, and then there is the, um, the neglectful, which is not having any of these at all, no connection and no boundaries. And that does exist sometimes. And, and we just have to be mindful of all, yeah, we just have to be mindful of them. So it's yeah. really a balance. How does attachment parenting style fall into that? Yeah, and I mean, it's that's a term that I thought that I don't agree with it, but it's just another term thrown out there talking about like making sure you have an attachment. And there's a lot of like misconceptions again mm -hmm. around it. Like I've seen parents get told off online because like they're not putting their baby in a baby carrier and they're not creating an attachment. <laughs> it's more than that. An attachment is is really being attuned to your child. You know, there's a lot of work around that and it's a, more, much more complicated than that. Um, but, you know, when it comes to attachment parenting, I, I just always go back to the, the authoritative, making sure that there's a balance of a warmth and connection and the boundaries. Um, but yeah, the sense it, it's, it's just about being connected and attuned. Um, I've seen, did you, did we say responsive parenting? I like that one as well. <laughs> Again, oh, there's, so many, there's so many. Yeah, there are so, so many. Overwhelming, kinds of, really. but, you know, and, and that's why parents are confused sometimes, yeah. right? Like as a new parent, you Google and you get ready to like, see like, what kind of parent am I going to be? Maybe, you know, you're, you're questioning all that. You're reading some books and then you see all these terms and you think you have to follow a certain one or speak a certain way. And if you don't, then you haven't followed that. And if you're not putting your child in a baby carrier, you're not creating that attachment with them. So it's very confusing. But what I like about responsive is that it falls within what we sort of just spoke about, which is again, that warmth and connection. So be, being attuned and responsive to our child's needs is, is very important. So I, I don't mind that one as much, but again, it just comes back to balancing those two things. Right. I think it's also about a balance in the sense that I think parents very easily feel guilty, which I love yeah. that you go very much against that and everything you do. <laughs> because I'm a parent. <laughs> Yes. No, but not, I think a lot of people who are supposed to parenting extras may be parents too. Mm -hmm. Possibly oh yeah, they are. Kids. Yes. But I, <laughs> I, I, no, I think for me, it's just, I, I, you know, for years I was talking about child development. So Curious Neuron has, has really evolved across the years. I initially coming out of research, I was summarizing studies for parents and it was really scientific. And when I look back at those blog posts, I was like, Ugh, who read this? <laughs> Why did I write it this way? But I hadn't understood how to communicate the science effectively to parents. I it was a new parent myself. And I coming out of research, I was still heavily like based into the, like this jargon stuff. Then I, I, as I became a parent and started speaking to more parents, I realized that I, I needed to simplify it. I needed to really break it down. And then I started realizing that not only should I be talking about child development, but the parent matters a lot. And because I had just given birth to my second child, mentally, I was struggling a little bit after the birth of my second child. And I said, okay, I need to make sure that I nurture and support the the parents too, because they're a big part of this child's development. And then that sort of evolved into a bit of storytelling through Curious Neuron, which is where I am right now. And I'm really happy in this space because I get to share my mistakes, my successes and my you know, challenges as well as a parent, because that's how we connect as parents. Sometimes it's not even about the science. Sometimes it's just about saying, I messed up today because I yelled or I, I said something I didn't want to say to my child. 
And then other parents say, well, I feel seen now. And, and thank you. That's all I needed today. <laughs> right. It wasn't even about the science. It was just about feeling human for a moment. <laughs> Right, because I think we all feel under so much pressure to be the perfect parent. There is no such thing. No, it's a myth. <laughs> it, yeah. I love the idea of the good enough parent. Yes. Why did that persist? Why isn't there the good enough parenting style? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That should be a thing, right? <laughs> but it should. It's, so it all comes back to that guilt, right? And that idea that we need to be perfect for our kids. And we're not going to be perfect. We will never be perfect. Because even if we were and had two kids in the, and, and living in our home and we were considered whatever is, is considered to be the perfect parent, both children would still not grow up the same way. They right. still have their own temperament and character and personality and they might not um, take in a certain event the same way because they, they are their own person. So I can parent perfectly and it doesn't matter because you know, our children are each their own person. So, you know, this idea of perfect parenting and balancing everything, it's not, it's not, it's not real. Uh, we just have to be comfortable with mistakes and understand that we're going to make them and learn from them and be okay with that. And that's why I now openly share every single mistake that I make, because, you know, there's this idea that when you talk about parenting, that you know what you're doing, but you don't, <laughs> we don't, we're, we're all learning. Right, you're learning as you're going. You're learning the exactly. book that is your particular child. And I love how yes. you talked about your three kids being, what was it, air, water, and fire? Oh, yes. <laughs> I love that you said that. Exactly. And again, all raised in the same home, but literally, I would say within two months of birth, I could really tell like what the firstborn was very calm and rarely cried to the point that people noticed. The second one cried from the moment he came out. Like he just, the doctor even said like, wow, he's crying a lot. <laughs> and then the third one, he just came out like fire. Like I'm here, here I am, you know, like <laughs> this is it. Red me world. Cause I'm here. <laughs> exactly. And this personality was so um, uh, present from the moment of his birth. So, you know, it's, it's, again, it, we can, parenting is important and the environment is very important, but we also have to remember that each child brings their own um, color to it. Right. And I think it's important for parents to have that confidence. I find that the first time parents, it's so hard mm. for them to trust themselves Mm. It is. And that's it is. why I think your information is so, so valuable. Well, and I don't want to tell, I don't want to give the parent the script. I, I, I want to give the guidelines, but I don't want to give a script. And, and the reason why is because I don't know you as a parent. I don't know your child and you need to get to know your child and you need to figure out what works best for them. Cause I can give you advice and I do give advice, but then I always remind parents that this might not work for every child and that we just have to try different things. And that's what I'm pulling out from the research. I'm, I, my job for parents is to sift through all the research and to see what makes sense for me as a parent. And then I apply it in my own home and I share it with everybody else. And now it's up to you guys, you know, it's up to the parents to take that and say, let me see if this works within my home. And if it doesn't, it's okay. You haven't failed. It's just that it didn't work either for you or for your child. And that's what I want parents to have that confidence to, to test it out and say, nope, this didn't work. Let's move on to the next and one. That, and that's okay. I love this idea of the responsive parent because you were responsive to each one of your kids' different personalities and they could yeah. not be parented. No, the same way. we can't. No. And we, yeah, we, we often see that as a failure, you know, and that, and that guilt comes in, but it's, it's, we can't, we just have to, you know, and even like with emotions, I, each one of my children will need a certain support when it comes to their emotions or lack or no support at all, you know, with one of them. And it's, it's just about figuring that out, but we can't do that if we don't have the confidence and we're questioning everything and looking for scripts to what to say. I think that as parents, we just have to you know, maybe have some knowledge on certain aspects of it. Like what, what's the end goal of this? Okay. I want to make sure that my child could communicate their emotions, or I want to make sure that my child knows what to do with those emotions. And then kind of like we work with that, right. That's our end goal. And let's try different things together. Absolutely. We didn't define gentle parenting and conscious parenting. So before we move on to emotional regulation, which oh. I really want to do a deep dive into. Yeah. I, you know, gentle parenting. Yeah, I don't have the definitions of those particular ones, only the ones from research. I, I don't know, because again, those are all terms that came up through some sort of social media thing. <laughs> I, I mean, that could be a new term for permissive parenting, if not done. Um, which one? The, which gentle. definition? I'm on the gentle parenting. Is gentle yeah, parenting another that's, version of permissive parenting possible? Yes. From, so I, I don't want to say uh, yes, like a hard yes, but from what yes. I've heard, well, parents. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> 
but from what how the, the way that parents describe it is it's exactly that they're they're really going towards the permissive part of just making sure that they're they're being so kind and gentle to their child and again i think that kind of parent sometimes might feel guilty for saying no or they say no or they set a boundary and the child cries and you feel bad because you've made your child cry and then you go you know you're following that permissive parenting so it's it's I think a lot of working on ourselves and and seeing like it's okay to say no to a child and again it's important because later on those feelings of un- that feeling of uncomfortableness of because somebody said no to you you want to have experienced that many times as a child so yeah that, and and yeah I agree that's why I don't really <laughs> I, I don't want to put those types of parenting right. down but it's just really focusing on it doesn't matter what the title is just make sure you're balancing the limits and boundaries with the the uh, connection and sensitivity Right. And I don't think it's the movement per se or the word per se. I think it's what people are doing with it. I think for some parents, it's really hard for them to tolerate their child's discomfort. Oh, yes, it is. It yeah. really is. It And it takes time sometimes. And it comes back to also your own childhood, you yeah. know, right? Like, and that's what I realized by the time I gave birth to my second and I ignored it. And then I gave birth to my third. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks of like, whoa, I need to really get therapy and and, and really go back into my past and, and see what worked and what didn't work. And because it's easy to say, like, I'm going to become a parent. This is my first child. I will never yell. But you actually don't know until <laughs> something yeah. happens. And then you're yelling and then you're mad at yourself. And then you do it again. And then there's the guilt. And then you do it again. And you're like, what's wrong with me? Why am I failing at parenting? But you're not. You just haven't taken the time to process. really assess. Yeah, yeah. And process. Why am I yelling? Is my child triggering me? Why are they triggering me? Is it um, something about like being ignored? You know, did I, do I feel ignored in my life? Did I feel ignored in the past? Did my parents always, you know, ignore my needs? And now I, you know, it could be so much, but it really is important. We don't have to go to therapy, but just to actually take the time to, I talk about journaling a lot, like in parenting Mm -hmm. and writing goals, um, you know, setting parenting goals. And if one of those goals are to stop yelling, it's, that's great. Write it down. And then what's the strategy. And I guess that's the business part of me where I literally create Mm -hmm. strategies in parenting, but it it helps because you could say to yourself, I really want to spend more quality time with my child. I've noticed that my mind is always running when I'm sitting with them okay, so what's the strategy behind that? That's your goal. Great. Give yourself two, three, four weeks to do this and set yourself baby steps. The first step might be to put your phone on vibrator off for 10 minutes a day. You know, maybe the next step is at bedtime, not bringing your phone with you so that when your child is trying to cuddle with you or whatever it is, that you're not looking at your phone, you know, like little things can be done. Um, And it's just about really kind of planning it out. Right, right. And, and I think it really is important to understand where you might need more help mm-hmm. because, you know, there's this whole concept of co-regulation, which mm-hmm. I, I promise we were going to spend too much time on, <laughs> which I already did a whole podcast with um, the post-traumatic parent, Dr. Robin mm-hmm. Koslowitz. Um, And I also did two different um, episodes on anxiety and they're all related in the sense that when the parent feels anxious, they will convey that to the child in yes. order to help an anxious child, you need to be able to modulate, you know, your own emotions. Mm -hmm. And so knowing I need help with this is huge and getting help. Of course. It's huge. Cause it won't go away overnight. I think that we're, it's, we're, we kind of get really mad at ourselves for yelling and then we go to bed and we're like, tomorrow's a new day. (laughs) And then it's 7 30 AM and you yell (laughs) (laughs) because you know, all three want breakfast at the same time and you barely opened up your eyes and you're, you know, so again, it's about being attuned not only to your child, but to yourself and your own needs as well. And that self-care word, sometimes I don't like the way that it's used out in social media, like as if self-care is just like going out to the restaurant and you come back and all your problems and worries go away. Like it's much more than that. It's really the work you do on yourself. And we do need to do that as parents. It's uncomfortable, um, but it's sometimes just about journaling and writing down things that are happening during the day and trying to make connections to certain parts of it. Or getting help. I'm a big or getting the help. Getting if you help. Need to. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, know, I think we put so much on our shoulders. It's my fault because I didn't do self care. It's my fault, you know, because I lost my temper. I mean, that. And I also think that our kids can learn from us learning. Mm. I've said this in multiple podcasts because I think it's really important. Rather than think about it as a failure, think about it as your learning. And, your, you know, regulation. I, I, I love that because not only will you model this for your child, but when they're in school one day 
and they're failing at something or struggling at something, they will see it as a learning opportunity. So that mistake on an exam is always a learning opportunity. Um, and if we don't show, if we don't model that, then they will struggle to see that as a learning opportunity. And their mindset will be more of, you know, like I'll never be good at this rather than every mistake is helping me get better at this. Um, so right. yes, I, I do agree that we should model that. Right. And that's, that's part of resilience. So mm -hmm. that's really, really important. Exactly. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. No, no. <laughs> I just want to bring it back to that because I just feel for parents today. I feel like every generation, the anxiety is higher. And I don't even want to say that virus C word because I want to get a oh, yeah. not mentioning it, but that has not helped parents' anxiety. It's hard. <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's hard for parents because I was talking to my mother-in-law about this and she was saying, you know, we didn't have social media and we didn't, we didn't Google things. We just kind of did it and it worked or it didn't. And we didn't compare ourselves to our neighbors. We would just like kind of play and, and life was simpler. And I think now we're like bombarded by information and advice. And I, and I was preparing a presentation once and I was talking about parenting advice. And I, I realized how diverse, not diverse, but you would have the like, you can co-sleep. No, you can't. You can, you know, introduce screen time. No, you can't. You can. Uh, I forget what it was, but you literally can find the opposing opinions mm. on the internet. If you believe that you can't do something and you Google it, you'll find everything you need to, do, you know, to support that. And if you believe you can do something as parent, as a parent, you'll also find everything to <laughs> support that opposing view. So it becomes very difficult because there's so much gray. I, I, I think I had posted about this once. I think parenting is all in the gray zone. Like, I don't think it's as black and white as we want it to be. So when a parent tells me screen time is really bad, as a neuroscientist, my answer is, well, there's more to it than just that it's bad, right? Like, we have to look at the bigger picture. And that's what we forget. We kind of, the parents I speak with will ask me very specific questions of like, is it okay if I said this to my child during, during this specific event? <laughs> and I can't, I can't. Um, you know, I, I don't know because how did your child, re you know, respond to it or, or how were they the next day or how's your relationship or how did somebody else in their environment react to this? So I can't give answers that way, but we, we micro, you know, uh, parent, I don't know. I, this is new. I just, said this. Parent. Yeah, that's I just a invented that, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, we, we look at every opportunity as one individual thing. When in the end, it's the big picture. You might have yelled at your child. You might have sleep trained or whatever you did. But like the bigger picture, can we stop like just focusing on such small things and, and look at the bigger picture, which is really the parent-child relationship and the social skills between the parent and the child? There's so much more to it. Absolutely. So I call that problem, the problem of the, the parent who thinks they have to put the right and wrong things to say on their refrigerator. Yeah. Before they talk to their kids. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I also right. think it's the tyranny of the experts. And again, what I love about what you do is you help the parent be the expert on their child. Because they are. Yes. They are, they are born. The, the moment your child is born, you are the expert. <laughs> you are. And right. the expert doesn't mean you'll have it right. The expert just means that you want to do everything possible to, to get it right. And, and that's okay. That makes you the expert because you love them so much and the mistakes will come with it. And yeah, I, I, I do think every parent is an expert. They just kind of need a hug sometimes. <laughs> no, I know. But I mean, that's right? how you learn though. You can't learn without mistakes. Yeah. Right? If you don't make a mistake when you're parenting, you know, you're not right. That's, that's normal. And then your kids will say, okay, mom made a mistake and she picked herself up, dusted herself off and she learned from it. So back to that modeling again. Yeah. So but that's fine. How, how many parents from our generation, you know, now you were just talking about mistakes, but I had these flashbacks of my own childhood and, and my friends that I know of where, you know, on an exam that we studied, we studied really hard and we got maybe 90 something just happy, you know, in that particular subject. And your parents said, you could do better than this. The other points, <laughs> right? Where are the five? You got 95. Where, why did you get one mistake on this exam? I know you studied for it. You can do much better than this. And that's kind of stuck in our minds for some of us, I think now. And it's like perfection has become that ideal parenting and it's not, um, we got to undo all that learning. <laughs> wow. I mean, I think different people get parenting, you know, different ways. You yes. get parented in a more permissive way. I think I have to be stricter. True. You know, maybe yeah. you have an automatic, you know, recoil to the opposite, you know, way. Oh yes. Yes. You can want to go the complete opposite way. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So let's talk about emotional regulation more because yes. that's, I think, super, super important. It really is. It's, again, that happens to be the topic I discuss the most and, mm -hmm. and dig into the research the most because I think it's one of the most important things that we, we do need to start discussing a lot more. Um, 
where do we begin? Let's just talk about emotional regulation. So, That's a huge, huge topic. Yeah. I mean, I think why, why do parents need to know to pay attention to it? What do we mean by it? Yeah. What should we be doing to promote it? Because I think that we, we know we need to teach our children ABCs, you know, and potty mm. train and all that stuff. Do we realize we have to teach emotional regulation? Because mm. we do. Yeah. And it's a big part of it too. And it's not easy to do if you haven't learned it yourself. Um, So yeah. Okay. So emotion regulation is really how we're navigating emotions or something external that happens. And we're going to, we're going to navigate that particular emotion internally and externally. So how are we feeling on the inside? How are we talking to ourselves during that emotion? Like, what are we saying to ourselves? And then how are we acting? How are we behaving around that emotion? So it's, it's both internal and external. Um, And it starts uh, like some parents say, like, when do I start teaching this to my child? I'm like, the moment they're born. <laughs> and the moment they're born is just how you are responding to them. Every time we respond to our crying baby, and I, I'll take away the word every time because, you know, sometimes we have to go to the bathroom <laughs> and sometimes we, we have to let the child cry for a bit if we're in a car or whatever. So I don't want a parent to think that it's like 100%. But when we do respond to a child, uh, our newborn, their stress system when they're crying and they feel upset, they just don't feel safe or they need to be soothed or, you know, something is happening in that moment. And when we just respond to them, whether it's through calming or a calm voice or holding them or, you know, any type of nurturing that cry, then their stress system comes back down. And this big, um, like sort of myth that's still out there. My grandmother would tell me, stop holding your baby, you know, cause like they have to become independent. I think I posted about it yesterday, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, that's this idea that like the more we hold them, like they're not going to learn to regulate. So there's this still, there still is this really big misconception that a child learns to become independent with their emotions and become stronger and resilient if you let them cry, but it's the opposite. Um, They really do need us. So emotion regulation starts at birth when we are responding to them. And then their stress system is starting to say, okay, these emotions are okay. They're fine. They're safe. And I can come back down. Yeah, I want to go to the opposite thought process because this gets sure. to attachment parenting. I want to just challenge that a little because I think there are some parents who who believe, and that's what attachment theory is is mm-hmm. promoting, that every single you know thing your child goes through, you have to help them through it. Oh, they shouldn't be true, on true. their own. And so I don't want to give the opposite extreme. Got it. Yeah. 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 And that's why I said like I want to take away the the word every time <laughs> right. because we can't, and and that's okay. We don't have to always be there. However. The, the general you know brain response to being held is that calming but no it's it's okay if you don't do it every time like just yeah I, I'm happy that you brought that up so yeah so then as a child gets older and they're toddlers now they're having really big emotions and this is when it becomes uncomfortable for parents because we don't understand it and we've you know it's not like an adult will get mad at you because you gave them exactly what you asked for right it's 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 weird to us so kids are you know our emotions, um, you know, from, from the amygdala and the emotions part of the brain will, will connect and communicate with the frontal part of the brain behind our forehead. And that frontal part of the prefrontal cortex will tell us how, what to do with that emotion, how to rationalize it, how to calm down, like how to regulate and so on. But the problem is that children um, have a prefrontal cortex. That's not very, you know, that's learned, that's developing it's in, it's in the works <laughs> and it develops until, you know, their mid twenties ish. So it, that they have to really, um, we have to act as their prefrontal cortex. And that's what makes it difficult, um, for parents because they, we've never had to do that for somebody, right? Like we, we do it our own on our own. So I think what we have to understand is we hear a lot about being calm and staying calm, but it's really that co-regulation part. Now, from a child's point of view, um, they're looking to you for like that guidance. Like, what do I do with these emotions? And we've often, we can, we could see emotions as behavior, but because it's coming out of screaming and crying and maybe hitting and scratching, but it's actually their way of saying, what do I do with this emotion? Like, what do I do right now? I'm disappointed or I'm frustrated or I'm really, really mad and I don't know how to handle this. So I always tell parents like this the kind of like map that you want to see or the path you want to see in your mind is first giving them the right words, right? So when they're around two years old, two and a half, you're using those words all the time. I see that you're mad right now, or I see that you're frustrated, or I can tell you're disappointed. I'm sorry you are, you know, like it is disappointing that we have to leave the park. So just using the language so that they know that there are different emotions besides mad, happy, and sad. Um, Yeah, the mad, happy, and sad. So we want disappointment. We want to understand what frustration is. Then the next steps after that 
is knowing, identifying when they are. So continuing modeling the words, but making sure that you're saying, you know, your, your brother just took your toy away and they're crying and they're upset. And you were really frustrated or you were really mad when that happened. I could tell because you stomped your foot and you, you yelled, you know? So now that you're identifying not just the moments as well, but what they're doing when they're, they're feeling that emotion so that they become aware. That's when I'm mad, I stomp my foot. You're right. I do it. Um, now they're getting a little bit older. And then the next steps are really to say like, once they're like four ish years old, now you're really having the language around like, you know, when you're mad, it's not okay to hit. And when you're, you could, you know, exp express it this way, you could um, step away from the situation. You can set your boundary. If your sibling is taking the toy away, you're allowed to say, I'm playing with it. And you'll, and when I'm done, I will share it with you, you know, and, and it's okay to say that. So now you're introducing strategies to your child. It could be breathing techniques. It could be just learning when to, you know, uh, problem solve through an emotion. Maybe they're playing on their own and they're, they're building a, a block of towers and it keeps falling and they get really mad. Um, just teaching them to take deep breaths and talking about mistakes and that's okay. It's falling, but it's an opportunity to keep trying and to test it out. So there's a lot more language around what to do with certain emotions around that age. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> but no, that, that's great. I, I'm thinking though, that when you're talking to your child about their emotions, I think it really matters what, what state they're in. Oh yes. Good point. So yeah. <laughs> I always, I always envision a, a mountain. Um, it's easier to visualize this way. So let's say your, your child's at the bottom of the, the mountain and something's happening in their environment that's starting to trigger these emotions. So they're slowly starting to climb the mountain. It's a good time to say, hey, remember the breathing techniques that we learned you know, last week or that we keep talking about? Um, and this is why I developed the app so the, the, the kind of um, language around it is easier. But remember when we spoke about the deep breaths and blowing out the candles? You can do that now because I could tell that you're getting really mad. You, you can say that, but once they're at the peak <laughs> of the mountain, same thing with us, right? When we're really mad and we're frustrated with somebody and with an adult, to be told to calm down it makes it worse. <laughs> I don't know. Being told about that breathing, I don't know if you remember this uh, <gasps> breathing thing they used to teach you. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> no, I think right? that's what I say now, but I yeah. You but yeah, to throw something at them. <laughs> So you cannot tell a child who's dysregulated to calm yeah. down or to take a breath. It's not going to work. However, when they're climbing that mountain, you can remind them they might still get to the top of the mountain, but what emotion regulation skills and, and that co-regulation, it's not going to make big emotions go away. It's just going, going to help them perhaps climb the mountain and come down more quickly instead of going up all the way to the, that high peak. Or once they're at the peak, they might come down a little bit more quickly as well. They might not stay there as long. That's what we're looking for. Now, here's the disclaimer, which is important to remember. If you have a child who's neurodivergent or you have a child who's having a lot of big emotions that it, like many times a day and you feel that you can't console them, even if you're co-regulating then perhaps, you know, that child needs a little bit more help. And, and what I'm talking about now with the mountain might be very different for every family or every child. But the, the, the one that I try to offer parents is that visualization of the mountain. Once they're back down the mountain, then it's a great time to talk about what happened. You know, once they're calm and regulated and you are regulated because sometimes the parents, we are not regulated when they're dysregulated. Um, you know, once they're back down the mountain, it's a good time to say, Hey, I noticed that when this happened, you know, you got really upset and, and it's okay. You felt that way, but let's have a chat about it. And, and maybe next time you could do ABC and, and try to, you know, um, not get to the same place that you were today. Cause I noticed that like you were stomping and hitting and you hurt your sister and I had to take you away from it or whatever it is, but just having the conversations around it. And if you, and if you as a parent yelled and you were dysregulated even better, <laughs> even better because it's an opportunity to say, I lost control of my temper. I lost control of my emotions. And I'm really, really sorry. That's the repair part that helps build your relationship. It's, you know, if you're yelling five times a day, then perhaps you need to work on your own emotion regulation. But if it's happening every once in a while, it's, it's really good to tell your child, like, we all lose control of our emotions. That's okay. And, and I'm really sorry. Next time I'll try to take my deep breaths or do whatever it is that we spoke about um, for myself. Absolutely. But, you know, back to the neurodivergent child, you know, I think of that mountain as these are kids who go from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain, like they just fly up there. They're there quickly, so quickly. And I think that, um, you know, one mistake that parents may make um, is a two-year-old in a, a, you know, major tantrum or meltdown or a child who's neurodivergent, who's also lost it talking. I find that talking then doesn't help at all. 
Oh, talking to the child. No, now they're in the middle of that. I feel like no. it's like an emotional seizure, you know, they're yeah. there. Yeah. Well, because it, the, the, the um, what I tell my kids and now they say to each other is when our emotions are really big, we can't hear as well and we can't think as well. Mm. Um, so it just helps them remember like when they're really mad it, as a parent, it doesn't matter what you're saying to your child. Just, just let them, you're not ignoring them. You could be beside them. You can be, you know, at a certain distance, you could get down to their eye level and connect in some way. Um, but some don't want to be touched or hugged mm. or spoken to. And that's okay. Some want, might want to have like a space that they can go to that's safe. Um, but just let it happen. Same way for, for adults, right? If we're in a moment where we're just so enraged because of whatever reason with a particular person, the last person we want to see, the last person we want to see is that person. We might want to distance ourselves. So mm. again, it comes back to that sort of journaling. And and I, I, I think I've spoken about like the tantrum detective a couple of times and just like, understanding your child's emotions and and maybe taking a note at the end of the day and and saying you know uh i noticed that they have bigger emotions when they come back from preschool or daycare because there might be a sensory aspect to it right they might be in a sensory overload lots of noise and and lots of lights and sounds at daycare you know and when you they come home you turn on the tv you're cooking there's sounds in the kitchen you might be helping another child with homework so you're speaking on top of all that it's it's a sensory overload and we might want to like bring it down a little bit when they come back from, from preschool or daycare and just like be aware of the sounds. Let's say every child will be different, but the more we kind of just take a little notes, you know, a minute or two a day of, of point form notes of what we noticed in our child, what helped, what didn't help. We might be uh, able to help them a little bit more later. Right. And you could prevent potentially the tantrum. It's yeah, sure. hard to do much about it once it starts. Yeah. Yeah, it's all the in between. Um, it's 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 in it's the in between part that we're able to guide them and offer them tools of mindfulness or breathing or what to do when you feel a certain way or when you're worried too with older kids. Um, what does it feel like to be worried? What does it feel like inside having those conversations around emotions and and you know letting them know you could be in the car and um, what was it the other day something happened. I can't remember what happened with my kids, but my heart was pounding and I, I, something happened. I think it was in the car. And when we got out, I was still a bit um, nervous. The car must have cut me off. I forget exactly. But when we came out, I had them put place their hand on my chest. And I said, my heart is pounding because I got really worried. Um, and I said, what happens to you when you got, when you get worried and my three and five, um, no, no, I'm sorry, five and seven year old, they were able to, to discuss what, how they felt. And one said like, my belly hurts sometimes. And so, you know, having those conversations, using those moments as moments to model emotion regulation, um, cause that's all part of it. And actually there's something called the tripartite model of parental socialization. Um, it's a lot of words, but all to say that there are three really important parts, um, in the child's environment that help them develop emotion regulation skills far be beyond the identifying emotions and labeling them, what's even more important in their environment is the parent and how there are three things, how the parent models emotion regulation skills around their child. The second one is the parenting style. So what we spoke about before, mm -hmm. balancing the warmth with the um, boundaries. And the third part of that, that tripartite model is the interaction and, and emotion regulation between the parents or the caregivers that are within the home. So, you know, whether grandma, or grandpa live there too, or whoever, whatever the mm -hmm. child, whoever the child is seeing within their direct environment in their home interact, um, you, you know, if there's a lot of screaming and externalizing emotions, or if they see a parent that clearly looks upset and that parent, that parent keeps saying, I'm fine, that they're internalizing, then that's kind of modeling that in a relationship after somebody has said something to you, or you're in a big argument that you are fine when you clearly look like you're sad or you're mm -hmm. mad. And so it's, you don't, parents don't have to give all the details to their child, but just modeling like the repair part within a relationship too. Like you could yell at each other and get mad. It's, it's okay as, as a couple in the environment of your child, or, you know, as adults in the environment but to show the repair after and to say like, I'm sorry that I did that or to show that you're reconnected after at the end is really important. Right. And to be honest, right. To be honest. Yeah. Right. I think some parents think I can't allow my big emotions, you know, my child to see my big emotions. No, no I, I don't, I don't, um, I think it's okay for kids to see our big emotions. And, and again, you know, as long as it's in, in safe, it's done safely, but um, kids need to see that so that they feel okay with their own. 
I think it's a balance, though, because I think, you know, when you talk about co-regulation, I think we are responsible to not overwhelm our kids. We're the adults. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's to a certain extent, right? Like if we're, mm-hmm. I'm thinking of moms that I've spoken with that are either going through depression or postpartum depression and or have anxiety. And they, I, there was a mom that I spoke to two weeks ago and she said, my, my son knows something is going on because I cry every day. And now he started crying and saying, I want to be like you. Mm-hmm. So, And she had a lot of guilt around that. And she didn't know what to do with that moment. Right. So you can't hide everything from them, but you also don't want to put responsibilities, uh, you know, like adult responsibilities on them of saying like you needed them. I just wanted her to be sure not to say that she needed him to be happy, like things like that, because we don't want to put that on our children. Um, It's uh, what is it? The term parent. Parentification. Thank you. I always have trouble with that. It's because French is my first language. (laughs) And th- there's a few words that I struggle with, but that's the one, um, the infantilization, right? And the parentification, like the, we just have to be mindful of that. Um, so it's okay to show emotions, but we also have to be careful how we place the responsibility of our emotions on our kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to go back a little bit um, to when you talked about um, the tantrums, because there was something that I love that you talked about that because I know this is like, there's no segue here. <laughs> I love, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> I don't want to forget the because I was thinking. Oh, gotta- I love it. Yeah, that is, um, that's not based on science. That honestly, that, that came from my own self, uh, my, my own self, my brain. Um, but it, you know, I, I started using that on myself to gain compassion as a parent on self-compassion, mm-hmm. self-compassion is so important. And mm-hmm. I think as a parent, sometimes we get stuck in cycles of guilt and, and, you know, feeling frustrated and like we're failing everything. And I ended up in that cycle after my third, I just was struggling a lot with my mental health. And I just noticed that whenever, you know, I would talk about my kids' emotions or even my own actions, just adding the word, because when I spoke to myself was making a difference. And I shared this with parents so that it could help them too. Um, so for example, when your child is having a tantrum, you could say my child is having uh, my, I, I don't, I don't even use the word tantrum in my mind. Cause then it just kind of puts everything in one box. I, I usually, I usually describe the emotions. So I'll say my son is crying right now because um, he's sad that I'm leaving uh, rather than just saying, Oh, he's crying again. I just, every time I leave, he's crying, you know, like I, I try to break it down so that it's very specific. And I, I, it helps me gain compassion for them. Uh, Cause sometimes in some moments as a parent, you're just so frustrated and, you know, you need to leave a, a certain point a time or a, a day, or you need to get something done. And then your child is perhaps whining and saying, please, no, don't do that. Or please, mom, can you come? And in that moment, let's say your child wants to play with you and you're trying to prepare dinner instead of just saying like, could you just leave me, leave me alone? Like I need to prepare dinner. You could just in your mind say my child is pulling at my shirt while I'm preparing dinner because I didn't see them all day and they want to connect with me. All of a sudden, again, that compassion piece comes and you're able to say like, I, th- I know you really want to play with me right now, but I-, I really have to make dinner. How about you stand here and tell me about your day? Or can I tell you about my day? You know, like stand with me in the kitchen. I can't you can't cook with me, you know, there's the, the, the there's heat and, and it's dangerous and there's knives, but you can stand right there and we can have a conversation or, you know, just, just having that compassion piece. And then when it comes to you, um, you can say, you know, something like uh, that I've said once was like, I just yelled at my child because I'm really stressed about something or, you know, uh, you, when you have an argument with your partner, you could have your mind, your mind, you know, kind of set on that all day. And then your child does something and you yell at them and you can say, I I just yelled at my child because I'm really worried about like a conversation or an argument I had with my partner, just being open about that to yourself. Um, and, and I got a lot of emails when I posted about this, I got some emails from couples saying like, Hey, we're nicer to each other. <laughs> I love that. I love that connection. Yeah. I would never have thought of that. But I'm also thinking as you're talking that toddlers often have the most ridiculous tantrums. And if you said because, because he wants you to put the Oreo cream back on that he ate already, you know, like something that you can't. Because it means something to him. Yeah. No, but I don't even think so. I think sometimes you just have a final straw. Oh, got it. Yes. (laughs) You know, so maybe you did yell at your kid. It wasn't anything the kid did that was so bad, but it was the final straw for you. Yes. That same compassion. Got it. It's not really that that one thing mattered so much. It was Mm. the last straw. Because it was the end of the day, or maybe whatever it is, but yeah, you're right. No more reserve. Yeah, no more. Oh, that's another thing. Um, the because also 
ties in very well to monitoring your reserve, what you just said. Mm. I, I picture it as you can picture it as a cup, like your cup is empty, or you can picture it as like a power bar from like, you know, <laughs> I, I come from the age of like playing video, the, the first Nintendo and we had like Mortal Kombat and like these fighting games and you're like playing karate, doing karate chops. And then you see your little characters like, you know, it's, it's green you have all your energy and then it goes to yellow and right. then it goes to red. And then after that is flashing red. And that's when you're about, you know, you're, you're, you're losing the game. And I see your cell parenting. phone battery on it. Yeah, that's same Exactly. <laughs> you can put it on battery saver. <laughs> yes. And, and, but I think that we don't realize that sometimes we wake up and it's a fresh new day, but we wake up with a battery at empty or the cup right. at empty. And because we, because <laughs> we yes. might have had a really bad or a rough day the day before. And, sleeping wasn't enough of a challenge or you had a toddler that woke you up by like jumping on top of you and you were in a deep sleep and needed that sleep. So I think that because in the compassion part and being aware of that energy you have or how you're being affected, you know, by certain events or stress during the day allows you to, again, that's that compassion part, but allows you to understand what's going on with you as a parent. So if you wake up and you just take a second to say, where am I? let's say with my, my cup in my half, in my full, in my halfway, in my half empty, in my near the bottom, um, then, you know, you'll understand a little bit more. And then when your child draws, you know, uh, pour, spills milk at breakfast and you're aware that your cup is already almost empty, you might be able to take a breath and create a space between their action and your reaction. And that's where emotion regulation comes in. That's where mindfulness comes in because now, you're able to kind of assess the environment in a split second. You know, it, it's, it doesn't take very long, but to say, I'm already on empty. I right. just need to take a deep breath. This is not bad. It's, it's not something they did wrong on purpose or, you know, to, to in spite, despite me, like they just, they're a child and they spilled their milk. You take a deep breath and then you do whatever you have to do. But just, you know, I think of the moments where I don't do that. And then there's spilled milk in the morning and you get mad, you lose it because it was already your final straw because you were at the end of your cup, you were at the bottom and you had no more reserve left. Um, that's so, what, yeah. yeah. And that's what real self-care is, right? It's, it's literally exactly. filling your cup. Yeah, it is. And filling your cup doesn't mean leaving the house. Sometimes we can't, mm -hmm. but well, sometimes we can't like two years. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we can't leave the house for two years. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, and that's why I think we're all struggling as parents because we don't have, mm -hmm. it's not even about the reserve anymore that that cup has a hole in it. <laughs> right. Oh, it's so true. Right? It's, leaking. it's leaking. It's leaking. There's a hole and we can't, the more we, we do everything we possibly can to fill it up and, and it's nothing is changing. And I think we're just, it's, you know, at that point now and um, the self-care part for me so what happened after i had my third child is i always envisioned like leaving the home as self-care and i wasn't able anymore and then the pandemic hit and it was really really hard to be home with three very small kids that are all two years apart and and to just have no idea how to do this you know so for me it, would, it was realizing that there were moments during my day teaching my kids that we're going to have reading time and for 15 minutes we're all going to sit together I'm going to sit there and I might sip a coffee one day, or I might read you a book, but it depends on how I'm feeling. If I wake up and I need to fill my cup, I'm going to have that. Sorry, <laughs> they're knocking on the window. So if, if I'm going to wake up and I know that my cup needs to be filled, I will have a warm coffee because that to me is satisfying and brings me joy. And I'm allowed to have those moments of joy. That was a big thing for me, being able to say I'm allowed to have a moment of joy. Because to me, as a parent of three, and just having kind of pushed through everything, moments of joy were selfish. Mm -hmm. And I had to unsee that and unlearn that because I'm worth it. We're all worth it. And, and we deserve to have just a moment for yourself, whether it's that coffee, whether it's reading two pages of a book. But I made them very micro, um, very small moments throughout my day with my three kids around where I was like, you know, this moment is for me. I need to eat a good breakfast. Sometimes I take a picture of that too. Like this is my breakfast. They had something else, but I know that I need protein and whatever. And that makes me feel better in, with my day. And here's what I do for myself. That's self-care. Right. It's really, really important. And you're not just helping yourself. You're helping your kids because you can't help your kids yes. if you don't take care of yourself. No. It's really not a joke. And that's why I get so upset about these, these parenting styles that involve you, you know, like the attachment parenting at the extreme, which is you have to parent while you're sleeping. You have to have oh, the gosh. child with you. You have to respond to their every yeah. breath. It's dangerous. It's too much. It's too much. It's dangerous because 
I mean, we're on empty and we, we can't do that. We, it, we cannot do that. You know, I, that community, that, what that sentence, um, like it takes a, it takes a village, you know, like it does it. And in, in the sense that for me, what the way that I see that is we just need to be able to disconnect sometimes and reconnect with ourselves. That's what we need. And, and if we're not, we lose ourselves. That's, that's what I, that was my, I had so many mistakes. Um, but I lost myself in parenting because I just believed I was a mom and that was my role. And that anything other than nurturing or taking care of my child was being selfish. Like I just, I always had to be with them. And through therapy, I realized, okay, hold on a second. <laughs> I need to, to connect with myself and I need to take those moments for myself. It's not selfish because I cannot take care of my child if I am not okay. Um, so we, we do need that. It is so true. You know, we also, I, I could talk to you all night. I really could. It's getting late. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I didn't, we didn't define conscious parenting and I do feel bad because I really do think that conscious parenting really sums up, I think, so many good pieces of what we talked about tonight. Yeah, I, I, I went through I, it in great depth, but <laughs> yeah, I think we did define like yeah, exactly. Everything we're talking about is that conscious parenting. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact definition um, because again, I just I follow the ones with research, and I don't really know all the. There's so many kinds, mm -hmm. but it's it's again being aware of the needs, your needs, being aware of your child's needs being aware and attuned to what they need. You know, it's, it's all about that. That's the, the conscious part of not just kind of like powering through parenting. Right. Uh, that's what we don't want. And so whether whichever definition is being used out there, it's just always about being attuned and connected to yourself and to your child. And, and that's why I think in the end, I always use the two words of curiosity and compassion. I think if, if we use those two words to guide our parenting with ourselves and with our kids being curious about why they're having emotions, being curious about why certain behaviors are happening, being curious as to why you're responding a certain way when they do something. And then the compassion piece with the, because, and just saying, this is what this is happening because of this, you're now understanding the bigger picture and you don't need the scripts. <laughs> if, right. if you follow it that way, you, it doesn't matter that you follow this kind of parenting. And once your child is learning that you follow Montessori or not, or this kind of learning, it doesn't matter in the end, you're being attuned to your child and that's all they need from you. It's it, that's the most important part. Right. And, in and my it, opinion. Does, it does pull everything all together though, because if you think about conscious parenting is you're also conscious of how you are. It's both. Exactly. Right. It's so important. Right. You know, I have this, um, sorry, there's a fly. I have this model in my mind of parenting where I see like three pillars. I, f I think the most important part of parenting is that we first nurture ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to, like you said, we, we cannot take care of our kids if we're not well. Um, the second part is nurturing our child. Again, it's that attunement. It's that connection. And that third part is community. I, I, I think that all three of these are needed for parenting where it could be community of just speaking to somebody and saying, I had a really rough day today and, and let it all out and not having the guilt of, you know, I'm not allowed to, to have a bad day, or I'm not allowed to think that I felt irritated or annoyed by my child. You're not saying anything. You're being respectful in your words, but you're just saying, that's how I felt today and letting it out and just speaking to somebody or just, just uh, um, if we can open up more about our parent, our parenting challenges, I think there's a lot of parents out there that would just kind of listen and say like, oh, I'm going through the same thing. Um, you know, for me, the way that I try to create the, the community aspect is on Instagram on Sundays I, is, is like, am I the only one? And, and parents who have been following me for a while say like, that's what I enjoy the most because parents will say, you know, am I the only one that has a child who hates broccoli <laughs> or whatever it is? Or am I the only one that um, feels lonely? Am I the only one that, that thought, parenting would be much easier than this or whatever the questions are but then they post this and I anonymously post it onto my stories on Instagram and you have like let's say 80 percent of parents who say they feel lonely and those who felt lonely and thought they were the only ones going through it feel seen all of a sudden um, but the numbers are really high <laughs> the numbers right. are high for for parents who just feel like there's something missing in their lives or they they don't feel connected and I think that's why the community part is so important Right. And this is the whole concept of social media and the perfect parent. It's all about Instagram, the Instagram, you know, image of the perfect parent. So mm. that is amazing that you have 50,000 people in this group. Uh, 50, no, 122,000 122, followers on Instagram. Is that the same thing as the community? Oh, uh, yeah. So 
I no, I think on my website I haven't changed the the numbers yet. So I have more than that. So 122,000 just on Instagram. Wow. We have 4500 downloads a week now on the podcast and mm. the website has about 6000 views per month. It's not much. We're just starting, but it's it's you know what we what I've seen in the past 2 years is that parents want to know there's so much there are so many opinions out there that they, they just want a place where they can get the science and make their own decisions for themselves and that's what i want parents to do i, I want to give them the information i don't want to say do it this way or that way i just want to say here's the science and figure out how it applies to your child and your parenting that's what's important to me that is amazing um i want to end with where people can find you but before we get to that i just want to not forget to let you give a shout out for your new app which Thank you literally you. just made a brief, you know, you breezed right by it. Yeah. <laughs> wonder, wonder, wonder grade. Wonder grade. Yes. Exactly. Wonder grade in one word. Um, I, I, with my work with parents now in the past couple of years, I, I noticed that the, where they needed the most help was emotion regulation skills. Everything that we just spoke about now, a lot of parents would say, how do I begin teaching this? What do I do? You know, like, oh, and also parents would tell me, I, I, I wasn't allowed to express emotions in my home or, or, you know, I, when I expressed it, I, it was seen as behavioral issues and, and I was told to like, stop. So not all parents, but this is what a majority of parents were telling me. So I said, okay, we need to figure something out. And now I, I'm so happy that I have a, a partner and, and Christy and I have developed this app um, that allows parents to do two things. One teach your child emotion regulation skills. There's these little animated videos with a cute little f- a character And that character guides your child in terms of breathing. There's like, it could be, it's for ages three to eight. And basically a child as young as three could learn to take deep belly belly breaths by putting uh, a stuffed animal on their belly and and taking deep breaths. There's visuals of blowing out candles or, you know, uh, just different things that you can do. Also emotion regulation. We've talked about the, the like sadness or anger about it, but sometimes a child is really excited, needs a parent to guide them back into like calmness. Mm -hmm. So we have, like activities where this little character like just moves around a bit. So it does like a, a certain kind of exercise to kind of release the energy from their body. And, and again, another emotional regulation time is bedtime. If a child is very excited and we need them to calm down and to regulate, we might get frustrated as parents because they're, they're excited, but we have like these meditations for kids that parents told us like really help their child, like calm down at bedtime. And so there's that. And then there's the parent center. The parent center is where we create these audios, these, these audio clips, because we know parents are really busy and, and audio is great. They're five minute audios. And every single Sunday you get a new audio on your app that allows you to, that gives you like an activity or a challenge for that week, for example, because, or it talks to you about like, when to introduce certain things to your child, not when they're upset, but like before and after. Um, And, and what I like is the reset button. So there's a reset button for parents and I use it myself um, Mm -hmm. where some moments you're just, there's chaos. There's absolute chaos in your home. And that's when you need kind of like a best friend or somebody to put their hand on your shoulder or a calm voice to tell you that it's just a moment and it'll pass and you're not failing as a parent. So we've taken the words of so many parents and and put it together in like a two minute audio with calming music. And Christy just goes through that and, and reminds parents to breathe and counts one, two, three slowly and says like, you're not a failure. It's a moment. It'll pass. And, and you've got this that audio is just so calming. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we just need that. And then that moment passes and we're okay. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. That's available already. Yes. It's out on uh, an Apple store uh, where you, wherever you get it on your iPhone and on the Google phones, uh, not Google phone, uh, the yeah, Android. App? I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is it a free app? It's uh, it's free for two weeks okay. and, and then it's monthly or yearly. Mm-hmm. And how can people find you? Um, so they can find me uh, on uh, my blog at curiousneuron.com. Um, there's Instagram, curious underscore neuron. There's the podcast as well, Curious Neuron Podcast. Uh, and if they're interested in the Wondergrade app, it's there's the wondergrade.com uh, website and the Instagram as well, Wondergrade. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I appreciate our conversation. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at joma underscore org. 
Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A.org, or email us at health at joma.org.